Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Not long ago, the publisher of this book, Molesworth, the pioneer of Western design, sent us the copy. It's an interesting story. It's about a furniture designer who started making furniture in Cody, Wyoming in the 1930s. Recently, he's been rediscovered, and there's nothing hotter than his furniture right now. So we're going to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, meet the author of this book, and then get the whole story on Molesworth furniture. Then we'll come back here and try a hand on a piece of our own. That's next, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. Easy, Stoney. Easy, girl. Out here where the West was won, when a cowboy says, drop it or I'll drill you, he's probably talking about one of these, a model 9.6 cordless. The love affair that Americans have for everything cowboy has never been greater. Take, for instance, this place, Fighting Bear Antiques. It's filled with cowboy furniture, and it's right here in downtown Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Now, Terry, you wrote the book on Thomas Molesworth and his furniture. It's beautifully done, and I know this takes a lot of work. Why go through all that trouble? Uh, Norm, it's an interesting question. Over the last 20 years, I've owned about 3,000 pieces of Molesworth furniture, and I re really feel he was an icon in Western design, and I wanted to share his work with the world. Well, you got the furniture here to prove it, right? Yeah, I do. So tell me about these chairs. This great pair of classic club chairs date to about 1935. Mm -hmm. And these chairs, which cost probably $150 a piece when they were made, are now worth $17,000 a piece. Wow. Now, I learned from your book that he used local materials. He preferred fur. And this is not dimensional lumber. These are logs that he took the bark off of. And these burls, they just found all over the, all over the woods to make these pieces. Yeah, it's definitely back to nature. Mm -hmm. Now, he also did casework? Yeah, this is one of his trademark classic case pieces with pole legs, pole trim. But what really sets it off, Norm, is this wonderful routed panel of the mm. Thunderbird. Mm, that's great. A cabinet like this today would probably cost about $14,000. Wow, so these pieces hold their value. In fact, it sounds like they're going up. They are going up. And he wasn't afraid to make small pieces. No, this is one of his classic designs with this simple routed saddle mm -hmm. and a little magazine stand like this that cost eight dollars is eighty five hundred dollars today. <laughs> so what's the most expensive piece of Molesworth they have in the shop now? Come this way. What do you think of this, Norm? Well, this is a unusual piece. It looks like what, a partner's desk maybe? What I actually call this is a double riding desk. Mm -hmm. And I think he modeled this after the examples in Old Faithful Inn, which were made by Limbert about 1910. Hmm. It has a built-in light here and more of the natural materials right out of the woods. The bark's been taken off and these little pieces have been applied. Now the routing, I'd like to know a little more about that. We have these camels and palm trees. How did they actually do that? What they would do, Norm, this background is made out of tulip poplar, and they would trace the silhouette design on here, mm -hmm. and then come in with a router, and router this design out, and then clean the background up with chisels and cabinet scrapers. Mm. It didn't take very much out, but it gives it a lot of depth. It definitely does. I hate to ask, but how much is this piece worth? A desk like this with the chairs, about $40,000. Wow. He probably made less than four of them. Wow. So who buys this type of furniture? A lot of my clients who have second homes here in Jackson or summer homes mm -hmm. uh, have purchased most of it from me. As a matter of fact, not too far from here is the greatest collection of Molesworth in the United States. Can we get in there? I think we can. Got to see that. Boy, Terry, there's still a lot of snow on the ground up here. Yes, we've had a record snowfall, 500 inches. Welcome to Bear Lodge. Wow, this is a spectacular place. This is uh, the home of Dan and Gail Cook and was built by Mike Boschman. Uh, it's just a great property and inside the finest collection of Thomas Molesworth furniture in existence. Wow, well, we made a lot of turns getting up here. Where are we? We're actually only 10 miles from the town of Jackson, mm -hmm. out near the Snake River. Boy, you get all these burls and big heavy timbers. This is quite a place. 
It is. Come on in. Let's look at some furniture. Oh, oh boy. Wow, look at this space. You know, I've had an opportunity to go into a lot of great places, and I've got to tell you, this one is going to go right to the top of my list. This is spectacular. How big is this room? It's uh, about 50 feet wide, 75 feet long. The ceiling is 35 feet high, done in the old lodge style. Wow, there's no shortage of timber in this building, and it's beautifully put together. And what's with this chandelier? Oh, come on, Norm, you know what those are. They're branding irons. You're right. These are all hand-forged branding irons from area ranches, and we fabricated them into a chandelier for the cooks. Yeah, it's a great light fixture. Now, on each end of the room, there, are, there is a large stone fireplace. Is this granite? Yes, this is Montana granite. It still has all the lichens on it, so they didn't even disrupt that when they constructed it. No, the dry stacking is incredible. Wow, it's a beautiful job. And the furniture. Now, this room is actually a photograph in your book, correct? Yes, it's on the back cover of my book. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this dining room table is probably the largest Molesworth ever made. And it has these wonderful Thunderbird chairs. Oh, these are great. They cut out the shape of the Thunderbird in the backrest. It's been routed out to give it this slight relief. And if you'll notice here, he scraped the background to make it smooth, and then he would paint the edges to make the silhouette stand out. Mm -hmm. They're great. Now, in the center of the room, more Molesworth pieces, except now we're seeing a lot of upholstery. These are some of his trademark burl pieces, right, these burl which he was legs. famous for. Yeah. And as you notice, they're very comfortable. They sit very well. Now, he would use a lot of red, red leather, red fabric. Why was that? Log houses are invariably pretty dark. Uh, we have long winters out west here, mm -hmm. not too many windows. And these bright colors were very cheerful and they really lend themselves to his furniture designs. Mm -hmm. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Come on upstairs. All right. Well, everywhere I look, there's something beautiful to look at. For instance, these railings, these balusters. Yeah, these burl rails were Gail Cook's idea. She loved burl. They look like they're all one piece. I don't even see the joinery, really. No, every piece is coped together with no visible screws or nails. Wow, it's a piece of art. Oh, what a place. Even up here on the second floor, the theme continues. The rooms are filled with Molesworth furniture and the Indian artifacts that go with it. They really tried to follow the theme of a 1920s lodge in the West. Well, it sure feels that way. Come in here. I'd like to show you one of my favorite pieces of furniture. Well, I can see why you brought me up here on this balcony off the bedroom. Look at the view. It's spectacular. This is truly the epitome of living in the West. Doesn't get much better than this. No, it doesn't. Now, I suppose you wanted me to see this Adirondack chair. Is this a Molesworth? No, this is just a reproduction. Come on in here. There's some great pieces of furniture in this room, but over here is one of my favorites. He only made six of these. Wow. Well, I like the size of it, and I guess I might call it a credenza because it has a couple panel doors that angle back and a bank of drawers in the middle. It's a nice piece. And it has every classic trait of Molesworth. Mm -hmm. Leather top with the tacks, mm -hmm. these wonderful routed teepees on the doors and silhouette, right down to the antler poles. Wow. Well, I think we have to build a piece of Molesworth-style furniture, and this would be a good choice, but you're going to have to give me some tips on how to do this routing. No problem. Uh, how about some lunch? Sounds good. An elk burger? Elk burgers, all right. Well, here's a photograph of the original sideboard in Terry's book, and it's sitting on our version of that sideboard. It was a fun project to build, and I figured out how to do all this decorative routing. And what do you think of my elk horn handles? If you'd like to build your own version of the cowboy sideboard, a measure drawing will be available, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. The first thing I want to do is build the carcass. So over here on my work table, I have some pre-finished three-quarter inch plywood. This is the bottom panel. I've laid out for a couple dados, which will receive these partitions, which will also have dados for the dust frames and the shelf. We'll make those first. Before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. 
And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. To make the dados, the setup is a stack dado and a rip fence. This setup with a sacrificial fence is used to make a rabbit. If you look at how this partition intersects with the bottom panel, you see that the front edge needs to be beveled to follow the angle. Let's take another look at the prototype, and you'll see that there are dust frames that support this middle drawer, the top drawer, and there's another one right up underneath the top. They're made out of plywood. The front and back pieces have a groove. The sides have a tenon. We'll make the grooves first. Here's the setup to make the tenons. To assemble the frames, a little bit of glue on the mortise and tenon, and I'll pin it with some brads. Here we're ready to glue, clamp it, and nail it together. Now I can take this assembly, glue it to the base, clamp it, and secure it with a few brads. A couple of the plywood shelves will have exposed edges, so I want to dress them up by covering them with a pre-finished strip that has a heat-activated glue. Well, now I'm ready to install these intermediate shelves. A little bit of glue, set them in the right position, and nail them with a couple brads. Now the end piece, it slips over the bottom shelf and the middle shelf, and it has a beveled front edge. Put that in position and nail it. Now for the back, a piece of quarter-inch pre-finished plywood attached with glue and brads, and it adds a lot of structure to the piece. It'll keep it from racking. On the underside of the plywood for the top, I've formed a groove. That groove slips over the quarter-inch plywood of the back. Once I get it located, I'll secure it with some screws. Getting ready to start working on the face frame, but first I have to clip off these little corners on the dust frames. Now this little cleat is going to provide some support for the rail. Now here's the first piece of the face frame. I have the cabinet upside down, so this would be the top rail. I've already beveled one end to make it flush, so I get it lined up. Then I take the same piece of wood and use it as a gauge, put it inside this partition, and mark the angle. And that shows me where I need to cut it. The frames that surround the doors are assembled with pocket screws. To make the pockets, I use this benchtop machine. When I push it, a router bit comes up to make the slot, and when I pull it, a drill drills the hole for the screw. Take another look at our cowboy sideboard, and you will see some classic Molesworth design, starting with this very random routed pattern on the face frame. And I want to do that to the face frame before I actually install it. It is very random and it does fit within a confined space. Now it's believed that the inspiration might have come from the wormhole trails that you would see in old timbers in a log home. It does give it a nice look. Now to make it, I've laid out the confines where I want to reroute the design. And the tool I'm going to use is a high-speed rotary tool. These tools come with dozens of accessories. I've installed a router-like base and a 1 8 inch router bit. I've attached it to my vac, and I'll just start at one end of the window of the design and just make a very random pattern. Now the idea is to just keep moving in a continuous motion, creating nice soft curves, not too many right angles, and keep them pretty close together. He never left much space between the routed design. Okay, we got a good start today on our cowboy sideboard. Before I leave tonight, I'll finish cutting this decorative detail in the face frame. Tomorrow, we'll make some doors, drawers, and put the legs on, as well as the elk horns. Well, I did finish the routing on the face frames last night, and now it's just a matter of attaching them to the case with some glue and brads. 
Here's one of the rails for between the drawers. I've carefully cut it to length, and you can see when I push it in, it's shy of this corner. So I'm going to need to add a little filler onto that dust frame first, and then I'll put the rail on. With the case still upside down, I'm going to install these filler blocks. They go underneath the dust frames, and what it'll do is keep the drawer from tipping out when it's opened. Just want to make sure that it's flush to the rail. These pieces of half-inch plywood build up the edge of the top. These blocks, which I'm gluing and nailing to the bottom of the case, will support the log legs. The door frames couldn't be simpler. Some three-quarter inch stock that's rabbited on the inside to receive the panel. I've cut slots for biscuits to reinforce the joint. A little bit of glue and some brads will hold the miters together. Okay, everything is clamped securely. When the glue dries, I'll route the face to match the face frame. Here's one of the doors from the prototype. The panel sits in that rabbit that I made, and it's held in place with a few clips so it can freely move. When I looked at the prototype, I took some images, and I made a copy of the teepee on some tracing paper. Underneath this is the blank for another panel. This is artist transfer paper. It's sort of like carbon paper, and I've correctly located the image. Now I'm just going to take my pencil, and by pressing down, the image will appear on the wood. All right, let's see how we did. Pull this off. Okay, so now we have an image of the teepee on the wood. I'm going to use my high-speed rotary tool again with the 1 8 inch bit to go around the outline and work these tight areas up here. I also found that it's useful to wear these magnifying glasses when I'm trying to make those very accurate cuts. So these and some ear protection, and I'll be ready to go. Okay, that takes care of all I'm going to do with the rotary tool. Now I'm going to switch to a conventional router with a fence to do the edge. Then I'll remove the fence and freehand the rest of the material away. Now here I've set up a full-size router with a half-inch straight-cutting bit and a guide fence to do the perimeter. The router does a pretty good job removing that material, but it leaves it a little rough. I could sand it all smooth, but what works a lot better is a furniture scraper. Makes it nice and smooth, and any corners that I didn't finish, I'll just do that with hand tools. Now for the drawers. There are three of them. Here are the elements. The front, three-quarter inch poplar, and there's a decorative detail routed out using the same techniques I did on the door panel. The sides and the back made out of 5 16 inch poplar. I've run grooves for the bottom and for the back panel and a pre-finished plywood bottom. I'll assemble all the pieces using some glue and brads. No glue in the grooves for the bottom. I want that to float. The back slips into the dados in the sides, and we'll secure that with glue and brads. Well, there they are. Each drawer is slightly different. We'll show the detail in the measured drawing, as well as a sample of this routed detail. Now for the legs. They're basically just pieces of log. These have had the bark removed, probably on a lathe, but I don't want a lathe look. I want it to be a little rougher. I've clamped it here in my table. You could clamp it in a lathe as well. There are a couple different tools I can use to make it look like it's been hand peeled rather than turned. Use a spoke shave, just shaving off bits, giving it a rustic look. Or even a low angle block plane seems to work well. Just want to keep it as random as possible. And once the legs are cut to length, I locate them on the cabinet, drill a through hole with the countersink for this four and a half inch screw. I also drill a pilot hole in the leg itself. And just attach it with a little bit of glue. Well, we're gating on it now. We're ready for the handles on the doors and the drawers. 
Terry sent me some elk antlers, a full rack from an elk who didn't need them anymore. And I cut them up into pieces on the bandsaw, sanded the edges smooth, and pre-drilled for these stove bolts, which I used to attach them to the door. Simply push them through and secure it with a nut. Now on the drawers, I used a little bit longer piece of the antler. Again, stove bolts through pre-drilled holes and attached with a couple nuts. Now once I finish making the handles, I'll do a little more final sanding and this piece will be ready for the finishing room. The finishing program for our piece of cowboy furniture started with a water-based stain known as Vermont maple and I got it in all the nooks and crannies. Now I'm applying a lacquer sanding sealer and that will seal the piece. Once that's dry, we'll put on several coats of satin lacquer and then we'll be ready for the highlights. Now for one of the classic features of a Molesworth piece, the way he treated the images that we routed out. Those images are proud of the field. And he would paint them. We're gonna use a satin paintable lacquer now, by painting it black, it really makes that image come forward. It really makes it pop out. Same thing on the draw fronts. The animal prints stick forward and the perimeter of the draw. Now, in the doors, he would highlight the edges. And I found that I would use masking tape to cover this edge, the inside edge, and then outline the little strip. Once the lacquer is dry, I simply can peel off the masking tape, and I get a nice, crisp line all the way around the door. I have one more draw front to do, set up over here with the masking tape on it. And here's that brushable lacquer, which I've tinted black. I'm using an artist brush, which I simply flood. And here's the uh, bare print, I think it is. And I just dab it on, just dab it. And if a little bit gets on the field, I just take a rag and clean it up. It might take a couple coats to get it completely done. Because the field has already been lacquered, the cleanup is real easy. Now for the edge, you simply brush it on. Don't fuss with it because the more you brush lacquer, the harder it gets to get a smooth coat. And that didn't cover, but in 30 minutes, I can put another coat on. Well now for the leather. It goes right on the plywood top. I stretch it and staple it underneath the edge and make little relief cuts so it can come around the corners nice and smooth. And now a piece of black leather for the contrast. And I start by stapling it with the face in. Now I staple on a piece of one inch wide cardboard. Now it's just a matter of folding it back over, pulling it tight and stapling it underneath. Well, a few nips and tucks here and we'll dress it up with a few brass tacks. I have these nice hammerhead tacks that I had Terry send me, and I'm installing them about four and a quarter inches on center. Well, here it is, our completed sideboard with teepees, beer prints, and authentic Elkhorn handles. Now all I have to do is find a buckaroo who needs a Molesworth sideboard. That shouldn't be too difficult. Now let me show you what we're gonna build next time. It's a painted cupboard. It's built in two parts, a base and an upper section. It has this nice arched door and this pinched cornice. And wait till you see the color on the inside, just like the original. It was fun to build, and I'll show you how to do it next time, right here in the New Yankee Workshop. If you've enjoyed this New Yankee project, you may wanna try some of the others. There are projects meant for the workshop, the garden, the kitchen, and many more. So whether you're a fan of shaker style, or colonial, arts and crafts, or Chippendale, there may be a norm project you'd like to build. Whether it's a clock or a gazebo, a picnic bench or a Windsor chair, a child's toy or a sailboat, Visit the New Yankee website at www.newyankee.com for a complete listing.